Right, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, friends of the H SA Hockey Legends. Um, it's Juan Evans here, and today I'm live from the Bean Green Coffee Roastery in Glenwood, Durban. I'll give you a little view of the roastery. There's Mel, my, uh, my business partner. And uh, today we are going to be talking to the legend himself, Greg Beefy Nickel. So I'm hugely excited to be able to chat. Uh, to Beef, he's in New Zealand, um, and I've been emailing him the, the last few days um, and getting in touch and just you know teeing up this interview. So yeah, Beefy will will log on now and join us. So yeah, very excited to chat to to Greg Nickel today. Um, a little bit of history: um, I played with Beefy first in at Durban Varsity in 2000. Um, we played in the same team there with uh, with Sevens, with Jodax, Grant Smith, uh, Paul Hamlin. Um, a great team of guys in that in that varsity team. Um, I don't know that I ever played for the Raiders with Beefy, but um, uh, I quickly made the national team, and he was obviously you know he's, he is a legend, and he was uh, the senior goal scorer in in that side. So yeah, um, obviously someone I played a lot of hockey with over quite a short and intense period, um, and uh, yeah, Beefy was just one of those those goal scoring machines. You knew if you got him the ball uh, at the top top third of the field that he was gonna make something happen and he was hungry to score. If he was like, he just had that determination. And the moment that ball crossed the, the D, the shot was away before you even knew it and he hit it bloody hard. Left from the left of the circle, reverse stick from the right of the circle. He drag flicked, uh, obviously, you know, Beefy he scored a lot of goals for South Africa, 245 goals uh, in total, and he played 200, 200 tests. So, yeah, really looking forward to, to chatting to Beefy. Uh, how's it, Clarky? How's it, Westy? See some of you guys are there. Uh, Scotty Melville as well. So lovely to see old friends connecting from all over the world. Uh, Richie Curtis. How's it, my boy? Dave Stanny. Hello, Nathaniel. So, yeah, we're chatting to you tomorrow, Stanny. So looking forward to that. Um, yeah, so just just waiting to connect up with Beefy. Um, there he is. Beef, whenever you're ready, hit the hit, hit the invitation button there. As you can see, I've got my got my mask on. Hey, Beefy. Juan, how's it there going, bud? Turn your screen the other way. You're you're on your side, Beefy. I know you're in New Zealand. You're on the other side of the world. You're a bit, you know, a bit sideways, a bit upside down, mate. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to work out how to do that, eh? Well, I'm glad you don't have a terrible New Zealand accent. That's a bloody good start. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for that. That wasn't good. It didn't take long to get into that. So you got to get the business out the way first, Beefy, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I get smashed for that on this side of the world, and then I get smashed for it on that side of the world. I, I can't win, really. <laughs> oh, good to see you, man. How you been? Yeah, no, it's been good. Um, yeah, so I, was, I was chatting with, um, funny enough, Pete Fasaki this morning, and I sort of said to him, I got you in 2008. I can't believe actually just just saying the fact that I've been in New Zealand since 2008 is just bizarre, really. Yeah, crazy, yeah. Beef, turn your camera a little bit down, so it's a little bit more so your face is in the middle because we're sharing half a screen here. There you go. That's better. Yeah, okay, I'll... I'll, wish, I'll, I'll figure out how to do this. Okay, what's up? You know, this whole RT thing, eh? the new age. Oh, uh, you know, us old folk, eh? we, we're getting on beef, you know. It's been a while. It's been, uh, <laughs> yo, it's been 15 years, I think, since I saw you. Yeah, I see that. I see COVID-19 has been pretty good for your beard. Yeah, you know, kind of been locked, locked inside. I think I'm, you know, I'm going to grow my hair long again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely. So we got the time and I think it's been... Yeah, it's been a cool experience, eh, Beefy, just connecting with, uh, with Clarky and uh, with uh, Brian Mibes and guys that, you know, I haven't, haven't spoken to for ages. This lockdown, if one good thing's come of it, it's like you've actually been forced to, to connect with, uh, with people and, you know, reminisce a little bit. And there's a lot of nostalgia around the things we used to do. And when you're so busy in your life, you don't really get that, that opportunity. So I'm super stoked to, to chat to you, man. Yeah, that's dead right. I mean, particularly... For, for people who don't live in, live in SA anymore, you know, you sort of just get detached from what's going on and the, the, old, the old hockey crowds and, the, the, you know, the groups that you used to hang with, um, it's pretty hard. And 
you know, um, you sort of get on with your life a little bit and, you know, people have got families and jobs and they're living all over the world. So, you know, there's a few positives that have come out of COVID-19. Maybe this is one of them. Absolutely. So, Beefy, you ready to dive into it, my friend? Yeah, have a go, mate. Yeah. So many things I want to, uh, I want to grill you on, you know. It's like the big beefy roast today. Excuse the pun. Um, let's start at the beginning, <laughs> Beefy. You went to... You went to Glenwood High School, uh, which is, I'm in Glenwood at the moment at my coffee roastery right now. So I'm literally like 100 meters from the school where you went to school. Um, tell us a little bit about those days. You were obviously a very prolific squash player as well as, as hockey. I played a bit of cricket. Uh, tell us a little bit about Glenwood and, and the guys you were playing with and who you looked up to and how you kind of uh, how you navigated that, that high school sports career. Yeah, I enjoyed Glenwood. Eh? It's, you know, a thousand boys, sports crazy. Um, uh, good rivalries with, you know, the likes of college where you at and DHS where Kelly is at. And those are probably our big, big rivalries. And um, I played everything, you know. So, like you said, you know, it's sort of, I, I, I think in the summer I'd, every day was occupied with either a match or a, or a first 11 training. And likewise, in the winter, it just changed the sports around a little bit. But, you know, whether it was cricket, hockey, squash, golf, whatever it was, I was sort of involved. And, um, yeah, you know, the, the schoolwork and the academics was sort of just um, something to pass the day until we got to sport time. And, um, yeah, I enjoyed my times. Um, some good mates, um, some good um, sports mates who have gone on and, and done some good things. And um, I still remember, um, you know, probably in Standard 9, Oh, no, Standard 8, I played cricket against Cully. Um, he was a couple of years ahead of me and um, sort of met him and then, un you know, uncovered what he was doing on the hockey field as well. And still remember going down and as a schoolboy, going down to watch club hockey to watch, you know, these these other guys that were playing. And, uh, you know, Giles was playing in the local league and Cully, Clarkey, Sean Cook, those guys, those guys were playing. So it was pretty easy to get inspired and driven about um, performing at the next level. And... You know, Glenwood was, as you know, it's down the road from Queensmead, so it was pretty yeah. easy to go and watch these guys play. And yeah. And Beefy, you, I mean, you played in a Tell School squash as well. Uh, at what point did you decide like hockey was your game and that you were actually pretty good at it, and you were, you started to make a few teams? Yeah, it was that was interesting because my dad was a dad was sort of chairman of SA School squash for years, and so I, I think I played my first RPT when I was six. You know, I think I went to under twelve. Yeah. Um, RPT when I was six. Um, I remember playing against um, Mark Boucher was actually sort of like our, our era is like number one. I, yeah. I, didn't, I couldn't compete with him at all. But, you know, we were sort of the young bucks in the under 12 bit and sort of carried on as you went. And and then I got to maybe like 14, 15 and started make, I think I got my first under Durban under 15 hockey selection, you know, and um, mm suddenly there was a decision to make, you know, the July school holidays, it was sort of like, well, do you go on a hockey tour or do you go on a squash tour? And mm. I think by then I was 14, I'd been on, I'd been on eight squash tours. So it was sort of like, okay, well maybe we do something different. And I decided to go and, and play the for Durban under 15. I think we had, Jabba was probably in that group. And um, mm. uh, yeah, I'm just putting my power in. Um, and yeah, so to go, I think, I, I actually think our trial, there's a right half, um, mm. which is, which people will probably laugh at, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, ended up in the circle, ended up in the circle sort of most of the trial and then got selected and then we got to the tournament and um, the coach sort of said, where do you play? And I went, no, nah, I'm a striker. So ended up <laughs> playing up front and get, getting, getting on with it. It wasn't so much a choice, you know, it was just sort of like, Mm. Um, wherever it went, it went, and likewise later with cricket, you know, wherever it went, just yeah. just play with it. Yeah, absolutely, Beef. And um, and then from there, were you playing? Were you playing league hockey in Durban, or did you only start playing league hockey when you went up to Maritzburg Varsity? No, I played in Durban. Um, so my first club was Tech um, as a junior. So the Madsen family was uh, attached to the Tech club, and they sort of had this. Um, Third, third team, you know, which was basically like Mike, Trevor, Paddy, 
and then a whole bunch of us kids, you know. Um, so I was like 15. 13, 14, <laughs> playing with, with Garrett. Yeah, and, and basically just, you know, obviously Mike had his Mike Madsen 11. This was sort of like a, a different version of that where he had maybe five or six of them and then they filled the rest with kids and basically that was their chance to develop us as, as young boys and, you know, I, oh, it was a ball, you know. I, I turned up every Sunday to play next to Trevor Madsen, you know, who was at that point in time the best striker that um, South Africa probably ever had. Yeah, amazing. What a what an experience and what a privilege to play with the Madsons, so really. Um, and then, Beefy, talk us through going to Maritzburg for a for a patch. I remember, I think my dad even coached you in the in the Midlands under twenty one side. I remember watching a training session at the at the Collegians on grass uh, with my dad uh, running that side for for one IPT. Uh, if my memory serves me correct, what was that that little period like? Yeah, well, I sort of went to Maritzburg Varsity on a on a cricket scholarship actually and um, cricket was sort of what I was going to do after school and uh, we were full on into it straight away and but logically you know the winter season and in those days you still played two sports you know or more mm. um, yeah. so hockey kicked off and we were still playing on grass like you said and um, I think it was awesome like I still remember in, in 94 I got invited to a box trial based on going to a, a BIPT, I think. I think we went to a BIPT in Valcom for Midlands. And we're still on grass. And, and um, you know, my philosophy was just try and trap everything, you know. And mm -hmm. if it's on grass, it's not going to be flat. Even though A.B. Jackson's and Collegians and all of those pitches were not too bad. Like, we went to Valcom and it was like, you know, it was <laughs> perfect to play on. And then I got invited to a trial and suddenly it was on Astro. And I was like, oh, this is sweet. And didn't miss a thing, you know. Um, so I actually really enjoyed my grass hockey. It was totally different. But um, to still be playing grass hockey in 93, 94, 95 um, sort of seems a bit bizarre. And, yeah, I just want to say how's it to Twashi and Blocks. Uh, Craig Carolyn's joined us. Hackers is watching. So a couple of, a couple of your old mates there. Uh, welcome, guys. Um, and Beefy, so I think like the big break for you was was Atlanta um, you, you, under Featherston. So you got into that side, um, and you went to you went to Atlanta, and you had like the tournament of your life. Um, and I think a lot of people think, or, or probably it's true, that you were one of the few people who started to strike the, the tomahawk with the reverse stick shot at goal. Was that like was playing like a backhand down the wall and squash, and you just you know you just learned how to hit it like that, or it's something you consciously developed when you were on your way to Atlanta because in that tournament, nobody could shoot like that. You were the only guy and you, and you ended up uh, being top goal scorer, if I'm not mistaken, or tie top goal scorer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, um, yeah, I got a couple of goals there. We, I shared it with um, the Dutch guy, Tucker Van Um Yeah, it was, it was weird, eh? Like, um, I remember in Durban, we were mucking around pre-Atlanta pre just trying new things and experimenting, just like, you know, we were just kids <laughs> having a jaw, really. Um, mm. there, there you go. There's, a, there's an African term, jaw. I haven't said that for about 12 yeah. years. Oh, um, there you go. Bring out the best yeah, of me. And I was, yeah, I know, I know. It's bloody good. Well, I'm going to get ribbed if, if the <laughs> key is working. Um, but no, it's definitely a very similar action to a, a squash backhand, you know. So, the, the leg position, the arm position, the sort of like cocked wrist, all that sort of stuff is, is um, yeah, very similar. So it, 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 it was something that happened pretty naturally for me and um, probably not so much off the left foot, which is where it's gone now, you know, like mm. you watch how many people hit it off, off the left, you know, mm. I sort of probably mastered it a lot more off the right based on the squash technique. And then later on, sort of the diving shot uh, maybe, maybe more, which was which was more around my striking philosophy around the dive, not so much yeah. around the backhand. It was more just, yeah. you know, what I did in the, in the circle. Yeah. And uh, yeah. and Beef, obviously, that um, you know, you developed, you developed, you became the mainstay striker for South Africa right until you retired after after Athens. Uh, and obviously, you know, I was really lucky to be able to to enjoy that experience with you. And the, and the amazing team that we had um, at that Olympic Games. Um, but you also, I mean, you scored a lot of field goals. And I remember, what I remember about you uh, playing behind you and making sure that we got you the ball was that the time it took you 
to get a shot away was so rapid. Like, you know, you were almost, you were almost lining up to hit it five yards outside the circle, knowing that, that you were going to get there. And as across the whitewash, you know, you're going to get your wrist through it. Uh, so that was the one thing I always clearly remember, like how quickly you got the shot away. And the other thing was, uh, you know, you also shared the drag flicking duties with, uh, with Jabba King and later Dr. Ian Simmons uh, towards the end of your career. So, so talk us a little bit about those two aspects of your goal scoring prowess. Yeah, I lost you a little bit there, mate. It must be just the connection. I was just saying, Beefy, about your about your drag flicking, which you obviously developed, uh, and you scored a lot of goals off the top of the D, uh, and then also just your like getting a really quick shot away. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the shot thing, um, I sort of just I don't know. Pretty early on in in playing, I just worked out that. Like I didn't, I didn't quite have this, the elimination skills and the, and the stick skills that a lot of the other players that I played with had. Um, but I sort of figured out that I could trap the ball, you know. So um, when it came to me, my, my first touch was probably going to be the thing that ended up being my point of difference. And if I trapped it in the circle, I, I sort of was already preparing to shoot before I trapped it because I knew that I was going to trap it rather than trap security touch, another touch. And then by that stage, you know, somebody's tackled you. So mm. um, I sort of, that was my first philosophy around getting quick shots away. The second part of that was that, you know, I spent a lot of time rooming with goalkeepers and trying to pick their brains. In fact, I actually ended up playing in goal a couple of seasons for like my second second team at club to mm -hmm. feel what it felt like. And And when I was keeping, one of the things that really struck me was that when you're off balance as a keeper, as in you're not set for the shot, um, saving a ball, even if it's not a great shot, was really, really difficult. So mm. I just sort of honed in on what that felt like as a goalie and went, well, if I can shoot one second or half a second or however, a fraction of a second earlier than the goalkeeper is ready, then they're not going to be set. And I don't have to hit it in the corner. I can hit it almost anywhere. And they're going to be compromised because they're, they're not balanced and therefore their movement's not going to be good. So, um, yeah, it was sort of that way of thinking. Um, and, and then the diving came probably next. You know, I sort mm. of, I still remember being marked by players like Jacko and stuff like that in trainings and just not being able to get away from them. And yeah. sort of figured that, well, if I throw the ball into space and... I know that I'm going to dive and he doesn't know that I'm going to dive. The chances are I'm going to contact the ball before he reacts. So mm. um, it sort of went around that mentality was, you know, and likewise with the goalkeeper, if the goalkeeper doesn't know you're going to dive and shoot, well, they're not going to set themselves and therefore you've got half a chance. Yeah. And the drag flicking beefer? Yeah. It, it, the drag flicking was, I mean, I went to, in 96, in Atlanta, we sort of like um, got it to Brian Lomans and Callum Giles and all these guys who were doing it. And like we had Grant Fulton at the time who was sort of doing it a little bit, but more off the bunt and slip flick type thing and no one off the top. And um, I was still hitting off the top at that stage. And I got back and thought, nah, you know, bugger this, I've, I've got to try it. And yeah. sort of self-coached and I was never... I was never very quick, you know, we had plenty of guys in, 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 in South Africa who were quicker than me, um, but I sort of just embraced maybe the, the deception part of it, um, yeah. so try, a similar sort of mindset to the, to, the, to the field goals is try and get the goalkeeper off balance, and then you can pretty mm -hmm. much put the ball wherever you want, so, you know, there's a whole bunch of drag flicks that went in that you look at and you go, geez, how the hell did that go in, but it was more about getting the goalie off balance than, than pace or anything like that. I didn't, I didn't have much pace at all, to be honest. Yeah, neither did I, so I know how you feel. Um, <laughs> and BP, I, yeah. uh, one of the things a lot of people don't know, and this is just like a personal thing for, for me, is that uh, you actually gave me my nickname Juan, which uh, has yeah. stayed with me for the last 20 years. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, we, we were in Egypt, um, I think, and, um, you know, the Egyptians spend a lot of time going like that, I think, and uh, it might have just developed off the, the version of Ian, I think, um, yeah. unless you can tell me differently. But I'm sure a few beers were involved, and uh, 
um, yeah, but yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, that was a pretty crazy uh, six weeks we spent in Egypt, you, me, and Sevens, uh, <laughs> playing in the Egyptian Premier League. Yeah, uh, yeah definitely one for the books. Um, yeah, and um, uh, yeah, so many, so many great memories. Uh, Beef, oh, can you remember like your best goal? Do you ever think about like a particular goal that you scored or like your top five that you that you think about and go like, geez, well, even if I do say so myself, those are bloody crackers. Yeah, that's a, that's a weird one. Um, like I, I, I'll probably, that's probably the question I get asked the most, you know, and um, it's, it's a weird one because like a, a whole bunch I don't remember going in. Like I, I don't remember seeing it going in because I was lying on the floor or, you know, being knocked over by a defender or, or whatever it is. And, you know, and then maybe I watch it back on the tape and go, geez, yeah, that was, that was not too bad. Like, you know, pretty good. Um, my bits, the bits that I remember are probably the ones that, you know, made a difference, you know, um, the equaliser against Australia in, in Atlanta or something like that. So technically they might not have been amazing, but from a, you know, point in the game and the impact that it had on the result is probably more that, that, that drives me. So, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't remember too many, to be honest, Juan, but probably the, yeah, the, the Aussie game won all. It was sort of first game at the Olympics. We hadn't been in the Olympics for, you know, a zillion years. And, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I was pretty lucky to even get picked for that team. I'll, I'll tell you a story there. Is, um, we, we were preparing to play the first game of the Olympics, which is against Australia. And those days, you didn't have rolling subs. So you got picked in the starting 11. And if you didn't, you, you might sit for 55 minutes, you know, 60 yeah. minutes, whatever it is, and then get 10 minutes in a game. And um, we had a practice game against Pakistan a few days before the first game. And it was a belter. It just had a huge downpour. And it would have been 38, 39 degrees, um, high humidity. And everyone was sort of looking around going, oh, I don't really want to play this. Don't want to play this. And I went, yeah, I'll have a go. I'm in. And, and picked up a few goals. And based on that, Featherston picked me in game one. Um, but I, at, up until that point, I sort of wasn't really thinking I was going to get in the starting lineup for game one. Mm. And just, you know, got a bit of luck and then scored in the first game and yeah. carried on scoring. And sort of then, yeah, can't remember, didn't, can't remember not starting after that, really. Yeah, for sure. And uh, Beefy, when, when I was kind of chatting to you earlier in the week, you were saying that uh, that Atlanta 96 tour was your best, your most memorable tour. Why was that? Um, yeah, probably just, you know, we hadn't been exposed to what that was all about. You know, um, apartheid and, you know, isolation from international sport, etc. Like we went, they sent that development tour to Barcelona, you know, to go and have a look. Mm. But mm. Um, and I was lucky enough to go on that. But, you know, suddenly, you know, you're right in the middle of the biggest sporting event in the world. And um, you suddenly on TV and you suddenly, you know, people are, are talking about you and you're drawing with Australia and you're contending and all that sort of stuff. So it's sort of, yeah, it was sort of like a wake-up call on what the opportunity was, you know. Like I was sort of like, yeah, hockey is just something that I played and then, that sort of suddenly changed everything. It was like, well, okay, I was suddenly getting calls from Europe and clubs and, oh, okay, this, I could probably do this for a while, yeah. you know? Yeah. And Bifi, you know, the one thing that, that I remember about you so clearly is like how passionate you were about following sports. So not just, obviously, you're a great squash player and a great hockey player and a great cricketer. You played a lot of good golf, that kind of thing. But you just had this like ferocious appetite for sports. And I remember sitting at the High Performance Centre in Pretoria like in those, I don't know, it was like, it felt like forever waiting to go to the Olympics and we were bored out of our minds, but we, the, the TV was always on. And like, you just knew everything about every player and every team and every sports code. It was like, it was phenomenal. You know, I was like, how do you know this stuff, BP? Uh Tell me about that. Yeah, I, I mean, it's probably just, you know, the upbringing, you know, I was um, sport sports family and, you know, every school I went to, just you know school was something I just did to get through to the end of the day so that I could play my sport and yeah um you know had a hand in everything so 
you know, it's definitely number one passion. Um, still is, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. I, you know, when you say about following sport, it'd be the exact same now, Juan, you know, like pick a sport, pick an event, I'm, yeah. I'm watching it or, or at least understanding what's going on. Yeah. Well, that's why I've made the quiz, which we're going to do in about five minutes' time. <laughs> oh, do, yeah, nothing yeah. to do with sport yeah, whatsoever. Yeah. And it's got yeah. everything to do with anecdotes yeah. and memory, which is uh, a bit dodgy. But I'm a <laughs> good master and you're not. So you're in trouble, mate. Yeah, no, I, thought, I knew I was going to be in trouble at some stage tonight. <laughs> so, but, but on a serious note, Vita, I think, you know, like for a sports fan, for, for us who are, you know, amateur hockey players and we, we play hockey because of our families and because we love it. And, you know, we never made millions of dollars playing the sport that we loved, even though we got to the highest level. Um, the Olympic Games is like the ultimate of that. And obviously you went to Atlanta. Then re um, Sydney was a big bummer. I remember you guys at Joe Cools hearing the news that you weren't going to go. I think it was Sevens and you and Clarkie and it might have been Twash. And you just went to the game reserve for like a week and you, you just disappeared. And we were like, yeah. well, we might never see those oaks again. And it was so gutting. <laughs> okay, do you remember that? Yeah, it was. Eh? Um, yeah, it's sort of, you know, and, we, and we're pretty good. You know, we sort of had established, we might have had, I don't know, seven, eight guys over 100, 150 caps. You know, we had um, some of the best players in the world. So well, I think we had a fair chance at doing pretty well in, in 2000. And, so it was yeah. pretty disappointing, and um, yeah, we just just took off, go and take our mind off it. In fact, um, it was a catalyst for me changing where where I lived. I thought, you know, I've been working on this thing for ages and ages and ages, you know, and loved playing for for the Raiders in in Durban, but it sort of like triggered a, a change for me and went, no, nah, I've got to change my environment, go and do something different, otherwise I'm gonna go nuts here, you know. Um, so I moved down to Port Elizabeth, and um, yeah. But, I remember that because yeah, one guy, uh, one I remember you just changed a beating, few guys' lives. I remember you beating us in the final of that IPT in Port Elizabeth. I think uh, it was a golden goal extra time and, and you got the ball and you laid it off to Reese Besson who then crashed it into the back of the net. And uh, it, it was probably the first IPT that Eastern Province had won uh, in a very, very long time. But I remember that crowd absolutely losing their minds. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was an interesting move because um, the first year, and obviously playing for Raiders, you know, you you went to RPT and it was sort of like uh, win the title or don't come home, you know, like you just it it, it became a habit. And um, we moving down to Port Elizabeth was interesting because the first year I was there, we ended up making the final and we were playing against Natal. I think it was in Maritzburg, and um, I sat in the changing room with everyone and said, "Oh, how many finals you guys you guys been in?" And, and everyone just went, no, this is our first final. So you did right there, Juan. They hadn't, it wasn't that they hadn't won. They hadn't even been in the final, you know. So um, it, was, it was a really cool challenge. And the, the thing that I got the most out of it is was, you know, I was outside of my comfort zone. I had to make a whole lot of new connections and learn how to play with a whole bunch of different, different guys. You know, um, playing in the Raiders, it was – like for me, it was pretty easy because, mm. you know, I had Borders and Clarky and Bondo and Toshi and Kali and Java and all these guys. And, you know, I just had to stand in the circle and put it in the end of the, yeah. put in the goal, really. And, and even if I didn't, you know, Shane Morrow or Craig Carolyn or Alan Kelly yeah. or someone could do it. So it was pretty yeah. darn easy playing for Natal. So, um, you know, going down to PE was like, a, it was a massive play for me, even though, you know, I really missed playing for the Raiders from a, personal development point of view it was it was massive yeah and um they're really chuffed that i made that call and i, I stand to be corrected beef but there was that one in maritzburg which was the, the first one that you went then you beat it you beat us the raiders in the final in port elizabeth and then i think even the next year at southerns southerns hosted it and you beat yeah. us again two years in a row so you picked up uh, silver yeah. and two golds uh, in the space of three years yeah we had a, we had a good run um, and, and I mean, the one in Joburg um, was a bit bizarre. We had probably the worst campaign we've ever had. And, you know, I remember sitting with Jody Paul and trying to assess what we wanted to get out of it and set our goals and sat down and sort of went, well, let's just not get relegated. You know, that's probably a good goal at this point. Yeah. And then yeah. beat, and beat Province in the first game, 4-1, and, you know, basically derailed Reeves' plan and, um, and then just took it one game at a time and, I think we played 
Natal in the last pool game and it was a dead rubber, you know, like we were both yeah. in the final. Yeah. Um, we right. decided that we'd just rest everyone and not get anything away and still managed to sneak a win and, and then got yeah. lucky in the final. I think Dezer Dolly got a goal and um, got pretty lucky. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good memories, you know, like I haven't thought about that stuff for ages. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, like I love my time in, in PE, met some great guys and, you know, as I said, got to had to learn how to do things differently because you know the the Raiders style was totally different we were just flooded with talent and uh, not that you know P the P crowd had some talent but it was totally different style and totally different mm. reliance on um different people etc and yeah it was pretty cool cool experience awesome beef so listen are you keen to do the quiz I'm gonna put my quiz master's glasses <laughs> on mate yeah they are yeah I'm, I'm, I don't, I, don't know about this, clever, eh? I don't know about this bit, but I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. Yeah, I've never said no to too, I haven't said no to too many things. No, you're going to do horribly, Beef, I know, because I, I made up all the answers. But we'll see. And then <laughs> I think, so that'll take us yeah. about 15 minutes, and then I think, you know, we can we can dive into some more. I've got some serious hockey questions as well, which I know, you know, there's there's quite a few people be messaging me saying, ask Beefy what we need to do to make South Africa great again. But we'll get into that after the quiz. Let's have some fun. <laughs> Then we'll get serious again. All right. Are you yeah, ready, BC? All good. All good. You know how the quiz yeah. works? You've got 10 questions. They put 10,000 points each. Your first question. You have to name three players that went to Glenwood and three players that went to Maritzburg Varsity that played outdoor for South Africa. Outdoor I'll give for you, South Africa. i tell you what. I'll give you 2,000 points per name. Maritzburg Varsity and Glenwood, so they did both. No, no, so uh, no, individually, so you know, not that they went to oh, both, okay. just, just in general. Oh, okay, so Maritzburg Varsity, Dave Viney. Yeah, boy. Yeah, Scholf and a mover. Yeah. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he ever got capped. I'm not sure about Scholf. Definitely under 21s, because I played with the under 21s, but oh, I don't yeah. know if he made the outdoor side. Maybe he did. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Glenwood, I'd have to say Madsen, Madsen, Madsen. <laughs> Done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and Maritzburg Varsity. Um, oh. Hmm. The, other, the, other, the other two that I can think of uh, in, the, in the kind of your era were Grant for Mayer, the Grizzle. Oh, and, yeah, uh, Bonnie, yeah, definitely Bonnie. Bonnie and uh, Darren Gallagher. Kelly, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Shocking memory. That's a that's a fail. That's a fail for me. Uh, you got you we got four thousand points plus. You got the Madsons. Yeah, I will give you ten thousand beef. I tell you what, I'll be a I'll be a good quiz master yeah, yeah. first up. The questions only yeah, that's get a good harder. Good start. Good start. You know. All right. Question number two. This was a hard one, beefy. Um, after a, a hockey practice at Stick Stop, where at Urban Varsity on V4 Field, we played at least an hour and a half of touch rugby as our training, because yeah. that's all we ever did. I don't think we ever played hockey yet before. We just played touch. Um, we went yeah, up the last to... Did. And, and, you know, we're in lockdown now in South Africa. I know you're probably not in New Zealand, but we're in a heavy lockdown. But there was a, a Greg Nickel-imposed lockdown at Stick Stop. And uh, there was a special sign there. And we marked off every letter on the sign. And each letter was a beer. And that was when the lockdown ended. Can you tell me what the sign was? Oh, no. I have not I've got no idea. No idea. I can't believe you can't no remember idea. this beef. So we had, obviously, well, Stick Stop was decorated with lots of items that have been procured from other parts of the, the, the town and Oh, yeah, and I, do, I do remember that. I do remember that. And there was a number plate. Can you remember what was on the number plate? It was a word of another club in Maritzburg. Collegians? It was Collegians. Correct. Do you know how many yeah. letters there are in yeah. Collegians, Beefy? Ten. Ten. And you said, we're not, you closed games. the door, you, you, you bolted it, and you locked the doors, and like most of the first team, most of the second team were, and then you're like, right, boys, it's a lockdown, we're not leaving, until we cross off with a black marker, every letter on the, on the number plate, and we did that, and then I think we went to Crowded House. Yeah. 10,000 points for yeah, you, that's, ring, that's ringing a bell. That's ringing a bell now. <laughs> uh, okay. This is an Egypt one. 
you, me, and Sevens, we went to play uh, professionally for, for the Egyptians. We played for uh, Al Sayedin, and you played for Shakea Club. And in the plane on the way home, there was a smoking flight all the way from Cairo to Johannesburg. I think we had uh, each armed ourselves <laughs> with a bottle of uh, either cane or vodka and a box of Marlboro Lights. And, we, and you slid some glasses onto your face. Can you remember what the name of those special glasses were? Mate, you, this is the toughest quiz I've ever taken part. <laughs> I, got, I got no idea. No idea. Yeah, I, I, remember did, I remember the gin. I remember the yep. gin, but I don't remember any glasses. You, you, me, and Go slow, go, go yes. slow goggles or something. Yes. Is that it? The go slow goggles. <laughs> you got it, Deepa. There we go. Point. And, oh, and what I remember, coming back to me. drinking neat, neat vodka out of, a, out of a big bottle, like maybe three cigarettes in your mouth at the same time, blowing like plumes of the smoke up like 30,000 no, feet me. in the air. No. And you just slid your... <laughs> oh, I, love it. I, I think I might remember a little bit of it. Um, okay, question number four. This is, a, this is a real hockey question, and you probably will get this right. Can you tell me who the highest goal scorer in men's hockey, field hockey, is of all time? Oh, um, I think Jamie. I think Dwight. Jamie Dwight. So it must, it's either him or Sohail. I can't... I can't. I thought Jamie got past him, but maybe Jamie's too. Maybe Sahel. I don't know. It was okay, one of those two. One I'll go with Sahel. I'll go with Sahel. Ah, oh, you got it. 10,000 points, VP. Yeah. Changing your mind at the last minute there. Jeez, you are on a roll. I, I know Jamie's pretty close, but yeah, maybe he didn't get there. Is he still playing? Surely not. No, no, he's, he, no, he's like 100 years old. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> question five, VP. Um, many people think that you're the top goal scorer in uh, South African hockey for outdoor, but that isn't actually correct. Can you tell me who is? Oh, I wouldn't have a clue. Was it, I don't know I was, but um, outdoor. Outdoor? Mm. This person scored 277 goals and 276 uh, appearances for South Africa went to the 2000, 2004, and 2012 Olympic Games. That's your only clue because you're doing too well. Uh, I'd probably say Petey Kutsi. Baby! Yes, it's Petey Kutsi. 10,000 points. Okay, you are, you're on maximum here. You're doing amazing. Okay, question number six. There's a multiple choice question. This is probably the toughest question in the quiz. Uh, Mike Twashi Cullen, after a fines meeting, sounds like A, a sick rhinoceros, B, a mating wildebeest, or C, a roaring lion. <laughs> yeah, the mating wildebeest, I'd go with that. Mating, you go, wildebeest. mating wildebeest, beefy. Sheesh, I know you spent a lot yeah, of time in the bush, yeah. but I don't even know what a mating <laughs> wildebeest sounds like. The correct answer is a roaring lion. <laughs> So, you, so you've dropped your first points, Beef. Sorry for you. Um, okay, oh, here's no, one that you should, you should get pretty easy. It's a squash question. Can you name the captain of the South African squash team that came to Abuja for the All-Africa Games? When, when were the games in Abuja? What year was that? 2003. 2003. Uh, maybe Adrian Henson? Oh, BP! 10,000 points! Hey, Jen Hansen is the correct answer. I remember him. I remember him like for looking everyone, like watching that game. And I just heard Adrian in the stands, like absolutely abusing every official. It was amazing. Um, okay. He has another, he has a sports question, Beefy. And I hope you remember this answer. One of my best memories, one of my best sports memories of my entire life. Uh, and you were with me, you, me, Sevens, a couple of the other guys at, uh, at the Athens Olympics. We went to watch a final of the track, uh, the track event, track and field, one night, one of the evening sessions. Uh, Kenanisa Bakele had won the 10,000 meters, and another athlete had won the 1,500 meters, and we watched them race against each other in the 5,000 meter finals for the gold medal. Remember the race? Yeah. Tell me who won the gold, 
what his name was and what country he came from. Oh. Hey, you can't Google Beefy. I'm watching your eyes. No, no, I'm not Googling. Good, um, good. So he won the 1500. He won the 1500. Uh, Kenanisa Bekele had won the 10,000 the day before, yeah. the, you know, the, the session before, and then these mm. two met up. So you had like a sprinter. Hisham El Garouj. Hisham El Garouj. Yes, baby! Hisham El Garouj. From where? Morocco. Yeah, boy. Well done, my boy. You got this, Beefy. You've only dropped 10,000 points so far. You're on, uh, you're on 80,000. You tie with Clarky, and you've got two questions left to go. Clarky's at the top of the leaderboard. Uh, and then it's Jake's, and then it's Twash, and then it's Marsha. So you, you, this is potentially you're going to go. It's like the Stig on, you know, the Top Gear. You're kind of working your way up the yeah, leaderboard. Yeah, yeah, cool. Okay. No, oh, you're yeah, not going to get this anything to, anything to get past Clarky, mate. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay. Question number nine, Beefy. You are not going to get this. There was one rule in our Durban varsity team in 2000 that you, me, Sevens, Jodax, all those legends played in, and there were only three players that you were not allowed to pass the ball to. And when I say you, I mean, collectively, no one was allowed to pass these players the ball. One of them was our goalkeeper, Duncan Holmes. So we obviously never passed to Duncan. But who were the other two players? It was a rule in every team talk. <laughs> don't pass to these two players. Um, I don't know. So just as a courtesy, I'm going to say Grant Smith. <laughs> You, you, we should. We, we probably should have said Grant Smith, but the answer was Hardy Van yeah. Zale and Jason Irvine. Hardy Van Zale, yeah. Hardy. I knew, I knew Hardy Van Zale, but uh, I wouldn't have. <laughs> I wouldn't have got Jason. Yeah. <laughs> okay, amazing. You're still on eighty thousand beef. You need to get a. You need to get some points here on your last question. Uh, it's a multiple choice question. Be fair. Um, the Madrid qualifying tournament in two thousand and four. We were playing against Belgium. Yeah. Charles was the coach there. We were 2-1 down at halftime. And uh, Clarkie scored an absolute cracker of a goal right at the death. But what m many people don't know is that their goalkeeper was actually an international sports person in another discipline. Can you tell me, was it A, cycling, B, road running, or C, mixed martial arts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mixed martial arts. <laughs> tell us why, Beefy. Yeah, I remember. I've sort of still got the I've still got the mark across my across my nose, mate. Cedric uh, <laughs> smashed me up uh, with a headbutt. He did. It was a beautiful headbutt. And I remember you lying on the ground. The whole team's running to celebrate, uh, Clarkie, and you lying on the ground. And you point up at Trapper, who's doing the video, going, "Trapper, did you see what he just did to me?" It's <laughs> <laughs> like the goalkeeper walks off, <laughs> and yeah, you're holding no, your face. Uh... He'd, he'd be giving me stick all game, you know, because I hadn't, I didn't, I hadn't scored, and um, he was just in my ear the whole, whole game. So when Clarky hit it in, um, I sort of gave him the big, yeah, one of those, and and he didn't react very well to it. Smashed me up. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So beefy, congratulations, ninety thousand points out of a hundred thousand, and it rockets you to the top of the leaderboard. You overtake Clarky and Swash. Uh, so congratulations. Yeah, nice. Yeah, anything to be ahead of Clarkie, mate. Amazing. But he, he tells me he beat you on the golf course most times anyway. So, you know, it's, it's a little consolation, to be fair. But, uh, you know, if, if, if Toshi said that, I could probably expect that. You know, I'd probably take it. But no, nah, not tr Trickle doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> okay, Bifa, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left to go. Uh, let's, uh, let's switch back to uh, some serious uh, hockey talk here. Um, after you finished with, that, with our national team in South Africa, you pursued a, a coaching job. Um, tell us a little bit about that and tell us from an outside perspective now with absolutely nothing to lose, be brutally honest about South African hockey and what we got to do to, to get better consistently at the world level. Yeah. Yeah, sort of, I mean, coaching since 2004, really, uh, up until about a year ago. Um, so a pretty long long gig in the coaching reins and yeah, I loved it, you know, um, really enjoyed the strategy side of the game, you know, even when I was playing, it was, you know, thinking about it and trying to work out things and trying to develop the next skill set that was going to take the world by storm, something like that. So the coaching side has been, been awesome. It's given me a long, a long career, which um, met a lot of good people, went a few, a couple more Olympic games, etc. And 
Um, so yeah, it's been really cool. Been watching probably the South African team from afar a little bit, you know, um, not heavily involved in what's going on and, and who's in the team and, and that sort of stuff. But I guess the teams that, the, the countries that are going well and the countries that are sort of jumping on the scene have, have done something outside the box, you know. Um, they've, you, you think about Argentina and Rio winning, winning the Olympics. Mm-hmm. And mm. people sort of go, like, how, how did that happen? Um, mm. And it happened because they did something different. You know, every they, they basically went and based themselves in Europe. And every mm. player in the squad was playing for a club in Europe. And they had a full squad there. And then when the European season wasn't on, all of the players went back to, to Argentina and they trained as a group there. And mm. you know, they ended up, you know, they didn't, they didn't sit there and go, well, we've got to create a, a league like the European League because that's not real. And again... That's not real in South Africa. You can't do that. You know, you, yeah. you've got to do something, but you, you can't create what's going on in Europe. It's just, it's too good. And, and it's drawing all the players. So just think outside the box, do, do something like that, you know, and they end up winning a gold medal and put themselves right on the top of the top of the pile. And um, it, I, I don't know what that looks like for South Africa, um, but uh, it's, it's definitely about trying something totally different. And it doesn't really matter what it is because like, whatever, whatever you're doing now isn't exactly putting you right into the back into the top 10 in the world. So mm-hmm. if you try something else and it doesn't work, well, you lose nothing. And then just keep, keep mixing and matching and trying it out. But yeah, the, the best players, we're the best players right now. They're going to be playing in Europe. That's it. Simple as that. Yeah, I think it's something that uh, Gareth Ewing, the current coach, is, is uh, embracing. He's telling the guys to go play in Europe. Uh, you know, get exposure, yeah. that kind of thing. But obviously, with the the Rams not well, doing so yeah, well, beefy, you know. What's that? So I say the Rams, the Rams not doing so well. Um, so obviously, it's yeah. Difficult. Well, you know, every you go, you go and get a gig with a club in Europe, and again, you know, that's uh, every euro that you, they earn over there is another euro that South African hockey doesn't really have to pay them, you know, or doesn't yeah. have to worry about. So, yeah. you know, they can have a, a semi pro or fully pro, depending on the, the contract career in Europe. Um, and then still be attached to a national program, which um, I'm presuming doesn't have a, a budget to pay players on a full-time basis. So yeah. um, you've got to embrace the clubs that do have that ability. And then when, they, when the players are at home, you've got to have a program that keeps them ticking over and, and provides them with an opportunity to grow. So international competition, et cetera, et cetera. And probably just need that one big breakthrough, you know, to get back into the top echelon and, you know, get, keep getting invited to the big tournaments. Yeah, absolutely. Beefy, we're going to leave it there, my friend, but we've got about five minutes or so left just to just to wrap it up. Uh, been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Uh, good to see good to see you again after so long and good to reminisce and, and talk story a little bit, you know. It's, uh, it's been real, real fun. So thanks so much for making the time to have a chat. And uh, yeah, man, really, really great to see you. Anything you want to add, anything you want to say to, to wrap it up? Yeah, it, it, it would be remiss of me to um, not mention Grubba Grubba. Um, of course. You know, uh, you, you know, the Grubba Grubba game is something we, we invented along the way through through hockey channels. Um, I actually spent some time with the New Zealand Sevens rugby team uh, over here doing some personal development and introduced them to Grubba Grubba and <laughs> absolutely loved them, loved it. Um I'm still unbeaten, Juan. So as you can see from my Instagram handle, um, it does say Grubber Grubber World Champion. So um, it does, still waiting, I, still I feel waiting for a, a challenge. Self, still waiting for a challenge from Stanny. <laughs> well, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow I'm interviewing the international president for life of the Mr. Grubber Grubber World Association. So I'm going to try and just verify that with him. Uh, and see no, if no, true. that's exactly why I mentioned it. I, I knew he's coming. He's coming soon. So. Uh, but yeah, he's. I think he's. I think he's dropped the ball a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, beefy. Well, yeah, man. Uh, just wishing you all the best. Uh, nice to see you. Take care. And uh, yeah, man. Been lucky to chat with you. Yeah. Hey, mate. Juan. Uh, great job. Like, I think this is a great initiative. Keep it going. I'm, I've, I've been watching from from this side of the world, and we'll continue to watch and stay in touch. Awesome, beefy. And when this is over, we're going to have a lockdown at Stick Stop, which is what Cully's now called his bar because they won't let us into the varsity grounds anymore. Yeah.
Yeah, no, I'll be there. <laughs> All right, Beefy. Nice one, man. Take care, yeah. my friend. See you, mate. Cheers. Bye. All right, folks, there you have it. The legend himself, Mr. Greg Beefy Nickel. Uh, thank you so much for watching. And um, yeah, please just spread the word. Obviously, we're just using this, uh, this platform to, to connect with people. But I think, you know, definitely it's got some legs. Uh, I've got such good feedback on it. So I think we can do a lot as a hockey community to help the current, the current group of, of boys and girls. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, resources and capacity with with people who have played for South Africa in the past or just people who love hockey in this country so uh, please spread the word I'm going to interview Stanny tomorrow uh, and if you never had the privilege of ever going on tour with Dave Stanny Forth trust me it was a barrel of laughs a minute so tomorrow uh, 12 o'clock South Africa time midday I'm going to chat up with uh, with Dave Nathaniel Stanny Forth uh, all the way from Perth Australia so it'll be a lot of fun um, once again thanks for watching folks uh, we'll chat to you soon.